Hello, and welcome to my weekly podcast that I call Through the Bible in 10 Years. And today we're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you're watching the video, notice that Fancher at Houghton College, where I work, is behind me um, in this new virtual background thing that Zoom has. Anyway, that's not important right now. Let's move on with 1 Thessalonians 4. I thought it was interesting that 1 Thessalonians 4 would come up in the middle of this coronavirus um, crisis. It's uh, March uh, 22nd when I put this video up, and um, definitely the New York, where I'm working now, is the, somewhat the epicenter of the virus in the world, it, it would seem, um, although maybe Italy is. But um, we're, we're kind of hitting the hard part uh, where everybody's talking about flattening uh, the curve so that it doesn't over, overrun our, our medical facilities. We'll see what happens. Um, there are only two confirmed cases in Allegheny County right now, although I know uh, a number of other, a dozen or so in the county I've heard are, are being tested here and there. Um, but uh, so it's, it's interesting, interesting to me uh, that today the, um, uh, in fact, I've thought about skipping to the book of Revelation uh, in this time. Maybe I'll do that after I finish First Thessalonians or Second Thessalonians. We'll see. But um, uh, it's interesting that First Thessalonians 4 comes up on the docket today because, of course, First uh, Thessalonians 4 and 5 deal with end time stuff. Um, First and Second Thessalonians are the most eschatological writings of Paul. That is, they deal with last things. They deal with the return of Christ uh, and such, and the day of the Lord, and so forth. So there seems to be some uh, uh, interesting uh, providence or coincidence uh, that um, we're doing First Thessalonians 4 as we're here in New York all kind of, we're not quarantined, but we're definitely um, intended to stay at home. Um, and not go out too much, except when we need to, to shop and, and so get food and so forth. But we are uh, in 1 Thessalonians 4. Now, where, where how have we gotten to 1 Thessalonians 4? Well, we, we did the first 18 chapters, or most of, of chapter 18 of Acts, um, which goes through Paul's time at Corinth. Most scholars believe that Paul wrote uh, 1 Thessalonians from Corinth. And so this would have been on his second missionary journey while he was with Silas and Timothy, who are mentioned at the beginning of First Thessalonians. And so um, the reconstruction of, so the first three chapters of First Thessalonians are, are kind of social. Uh, it's hard, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me that there have been those who don't see the human dimension of Paul's letters. Um, they tend to treat Paul's letters as if they're, they're just pure intellectual revelation. That is grossly mistaken, in my opinion. The first three chapters of 1 Thessalonians are social. They're, they are getting to know you, getting to know all about you. Actually, he's already, he's already met the Thessalonians, right? He and Silas and Timothy came to the Thessalonian church. They did not get to stay there very long, though. They were run out of town, I've argued, within you know probably less than two months. And so Paul was nervous, and I assume Silas was nervous, and probably Timothy too, were nervous about whether the Thessalonian church had really taken off. They saw the plane starting down the runway, but they had to leave town, and they couldn't email them to say, yep, we still believe. They couldn't do um, Zoom church or, or uh, Facebook live church or U YouTube live church. They couldn't do that. Um, they couldn't even send a, uh, well, they could send a letter. And so um, what Paul does is, uh, now I'm following the, the way, the impression we get from 1 Thessalonians is that Paul and Silas and Timothy got to Athens, and then Paul and Silas sent Timothy back to Thessalonica. And then Paul and Silas went on to Athens, uh, and then Timothy eventually rejoined them there. Now, when Timothy rejoined them at, at Corinth, um, I hope I said all those cities right, um, Timothy left from Athens and then returned to join them in Corinth. This is Corinth is fur further south than, than Athens. So um, when Timothy joins them, basically, yes, the plane took off. They have faith. They believe in the Lord. They love each other. They're faithful. So Paul is very relieved. And so Paul writes 1 Thessalonians and sends it back to Thessalonica with Timothy again. Um, Paul can't go there himself 
for one thing, he's now heavily invested in the ministry at Corinth, but it sure seems like he's not a welcome figure in Thessalonica. They don't want him there. They've kicked him out of the city. Uh, and so he, he has, he would prefer to be there in person. His letter, and I believe First Thessalonians is the first letter Paul wrote of all the letters he wrote. And so this is, this is the begin, this is the breaking of ground. Paul realizes I may have to send letters to these churches uh, because I can't visit them. And this is the beginning of a beautiful missional uh, tool uh, for Paul. And he will use it um, extensively, as we know. And um, he will write much letter, much longer letters than the typical letter. Uh, with uh, there will always be a personal dimension to them, uh, in most cases or in almost all cases. But then here in chapter four, he gets down to theological business. So he's been he's been doing the social thing, which takes up most of the letter, right? So it's that's not an unimportant. It's a significant part. The the relationship, the spiritual mentoring, the the good relations between Paul and Thessalonica. But what apparently, when, when Timothy returns uh, and meets Paul and Silas at Corinth, uh, by the way, this is a little different from the, way, the impression we get from Acts. Acts gives a slightly different impression. But of course, since Paul was actually there and uh, uh, we'll call him Luke was not, uh, I'm going to defer to Paul's version of, of events. Uh, I give the deference to that. But when, when Timothy comes back, apparently there are, are some questions that the Thessalonian church uh, has. Now, frankly, I'm surprised that in two months they got as much as they did. Uh, because I, you know, I've, I've had classes, you know, where I've been with uh, students a whole semester. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's, I have to take part of the blame for it. But, you know, where they just didn't, you know, I said it, but it didn't sink in. <laughs> um, but uh, so uh, we get to First Thessalonians 4, and we begin to hear some of the questions they have. So let's go ahead and begin with first one. Therefore, the rest, brothers, and I'm using interlinearbible.org here today, the rest, brothers and sisters, um, remember, if there are women in the audience, the way Greek grammar works, he's still going to use the masculine ending for brothers. Um, so uh, many translations say brothers and sisters. They're bringing explicitly out what was would be implicit in in calling in speaking to brothers masculine. Um, the rest, therefore, brothers and sisters, we ask you and we exhort you in the Lord Jesus that just as you have received from us. Uh, what it is necessary, uh, or how it is necessary for us to walk and to please God, just as also you are walking. Um, that, that doesn't sound like a good sentence here, but he, clearly he's implored them um, to do what they've seen from him um, and do what's necessary for them to walk and what is necessary to please God, um, and he believes they are. So he's, he's telling them to live appropriately. Not only to live appropriately, um, but also, also he's affirming them and saying, you're doing it. But keep doing it in so many words. You are living appropriately to the gospel. Keep doing it in order that you might abound more. So that's the first verse, kind of a long verse, not a, um, a kind of it doesn't come into English real well. We have to um, massage the English a little. OK, so. Um, before we get to the end time stuff, which is later uh, in chapter four here, he starts off with some, some general instruction, uh, particularly of a sexual nature. So we get to verse two. Um, so walk, walk the way you know you're supposed to walk uh, to please God. Verse two, for you know uh, what instructions we gave to you through the Lord Jesus. And notice the source of the authority of what Paul uh, taught them. The Lord Jesus is the source. It's not just Paul coming up with these ideas. It's the Lord Jesus. Number three, for this, for this is the will of God, your holiness, your sanctification, uh, for you to abstain from sexual immorality. Now, holiness here, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Now, he's not talking about a uh, ordo salutis here. He's not talking about a second work of grace, although that would help. Uh, that that would that would do more than what he's asking here. 
Um, but basically, what is holiness? What is sanctification? Well, especially in the Old Testament, holiness has the primary connotation of being set apart as God's, uh, be belonging to God, God's property, God's business, God's stuff uh, on the God side of the line, property line. Um, and so that's the primary sense in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it the, what, what I would say is perhaps a secondary sense in the Old Testament um, takes on added prominence, and that's the idea of, of purity. Um, now, there is a sense of purity in the Old Testament, but as you'll know from Leviticus, purity in the Old Testament often has as much to do with, uh, with the food laws and clean and unclean, what you touch and what you don't touch, what, what, we, what sometimes has been called uh, some ceremonial parts of the law, though that's not, it's not a perfect term. Uh, but uh, sanctification in the Old Testament and purity in the Old Testament isn't, isn't entirely about moral purity, it's, it seems to me. But in the New Testament, purity focuses especially, I would say, on what we might call moral, moral purity. Um, uh, and so um, God wants you to be set apart to him and be accordingly pure. That's the holiness bit here. And that implies that you stay away from sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is something that does not fit with the holiness of God. It's, it's right out. It's something that we're not supposed to, it, it does not, it's not compatible with being in the holiness zone. Uh, it, it's not, so if, 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 if there's a, a realm of God's stuff, uh, the God warehouse where all the God stuff goes, uh, and when we're, when we're holy, we are in the God warehouse. We, 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 we're on God's property. Well, there can't be any sexual immorality on, in, in God's warehouse or in God's property. It doesn't belong there. It, it, must, it, it must be taken out uh, of the property. Um, and so um, sexual immorality is not uh, keep, in keeping with uh, holiness or sanctification. Now, it, it is interesting uh, and I've talked about this in many places, um, and no doubt uh, when we get to the phase of this journey that is Old Testament, uh, we'll, we'll go through Leviticus and other uh, chapters, um, you know, for a long time. Um, but um, Paul does not continue everything from the Old Testament. Now, some people don't like me talking uh, about the Old Testament in this way, but this is just the way it is. Um, there may be bigger theological fish to fry that we can talk about, but in terms of concrete, there are certain commands in the Old Testament that Paul does not consider binding on Gentile Christians, like the food laws. And we do a whole lot more theolo theologizing here than Paul does. Um, we we get we get really riled up. No, 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 no. We can we can connect it this way, and I'm not and I'm not dismissing that. I'm just saying when we do that kind of meta discussion um, to at least be honest and realize that Paul doesn't do that. Um, Mark doesn't do that. Mark simply says, by this, Jesus declared all foods clean, period. Mark indicates that the food laws are not binding anymore. Mark doesn't say, oh, but we need to find a theological continuity here. We need to find a deeper principle. Mark doesn't care. Paul doesn't care. Um, he just simply says all foods are clean. So again, I am not in any way um, a rejecting broader theological principles or connections or finding those. Uh, I think that's part of what it means to read, say, Leviticus as scripture. So I'm, I'm not opposed to that. What I am urging is exegetical honesty that Paul doesn't know any of that stuff. Mark doesn't know any of that stuff. It simply isn't important to them, apparently. This is our, this is our issues. This is our baggage um, uh, that makes us so preoccupied with, no, I must, must find continuity with food laws of Leviticus. Um, Paul doesn't seem to, to be worried about that sort of thing. But Paul is very worried about the continuity of sexual immorality laws. That's where I'm going with this. When it comes to Leviticus 18, Paul seems to consider everything in Leviticus 18 as still in complete continuity for Christians today. Paul does not throw out any of the sexual laws of the Old Testament. And so this is how, this is, this is the reason why 
um, it is at least it's natural to consider that the sexual laws of the Old Testament are still in in force for Gentiles, that they are still binding on Gentiles. The reason why you might say, well, why do we why do we wear polyester when Leviticus say 19 says not to wear polyester, and yet um, we um, uh, we we follow the sexual laws. Well, the reason is because Paul doesn't say anything about polyester. Paul doesn't say anything about wearing clothing of mixed thread. He does repeatedly talk about avoiding sexual uh, immorality. And so um, um, that seems to be something that Paul considers to be universal uh, from the Old Testament rather than part of the, the what I would call um, specifically Jewish parts of of the of the uh, Jewish law in terms of the specific concrete uh, instruction. Well, I'm sure we'll we'll get around to this again many times before we get through our ten years. Um, there's also some debate about what the word sexual immorality means here. So the word is porneia, and I would say that probably most scholars have concluded that porneia covers a that it's a generic term that it covers a somewhat wide variety of sexual of uh, sins. Um, in fact, I would say, if you want to know what porneia means, see Leviticus 18. Leviticus 18 is everything you didn't want to know about how not to have sex. And that's that's what I think porneia is. Now, I do realize that there, there are some scholars who have said, well, porneia is distinguished from other kinds of sexual sins in other places, like, for example, 1 Corinthians 6, uh, is it 8 and 9? So there, porneia is distinguished from other sexual sins in that list. Well, the thing is, um, I think there's a mistake uh, hiding here in thinking that each entity in those lists has to be mutually exclusive. Uh, you know, it's kind of what, you know, we do with spiritual gift lists and things like that. Oh, these have to be all distinct. There can't be any overlap at all between these words. Why? Who said so? Um, we often use roughly synonymous terms in, in lists. And so I, I just reject that, that, that as, as exegetically and hermeneutically unsound. That just because porneia, so porneia in that list might be a more generic term covering everything. And then there are some more specific terms covered, like adultery or whatever, in the list also. So porneia can lean toward um, the not the other and the you know like in Gilligan's Island the 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 first theme song and the rest you know the porneia covers everything we've we've covered everything if we get the word porneia in there, um, including adultery even though we want to single out adultery because it's more prevalent than than bestiality for example. Um, so I reject that argument as just not being a sound argument. Uh, porneia, in my opinion, is a generic term. Now, of course, the King James here says abstain from fornication. Um, and so uh, for many years, I, I believe King James preachers uh, talked about this being premarital sex. That, that does not seem to be um, what is part of this, this term. Um, and I don't, I don't know, it, it's possible that porneia included premarital sex, but I really think that porneia here refers to a wide variety of, of sexual things ranging from bestiality. I think it would probably include homosexual sex uh, for Paul. I think it would include adultery um, and, and so forth. It would, it would include incest. Um, so again, feel free to disagree. Uh, I can't stop you from disagreeing. Uh, verse four. Okay. So for each of you to know, uh, for each of you uh, to know how to control uh, his own or her own vessel in holiness and honor. Okay, so this is this holiness, this abstaining from sexual immorality implies that you can discipline yourself uh, sexually. You can discipline yourself. You can control your own body. Um, uh, I get the impression that there are a lot of people in the world today who can't control their own body. If if the kinds of things you see on uh, movies and on uh, the television series and things, Netflix, are, are any indication um, people aren't very good at controlling their own body. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Did I did I have I committed an affair? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Paul doesn't accept that. Uh, Paul would say, 
that uh, God's will is our sanctification, that we are able to um, be in control of our, our bodies and to hold our bodies in holiness and in honor. Verse five, not with the passion of desire or of lust, as also the Gentiles who do not know God. Now, the Thessalonians are Gentiles who do know God. So they shouldn't have to fall into this. They should be able to control their own bodies and not to let their lust uh, and passion uh, get away, away from them. Um, verse six, uh, not to go beyond and to overreach in this matter um, um, with regard to your brother, uh, because God is uh, just or, or is, uh, will have vengeance of all these things. Just as we were told ahead of time, just as we have told you ahead of time, and we have warned you. So sexual immorality is, there, there were two main concerns about Gentiles by Jews. One, it was pretty much assumed, you know, what were the stereotypes of, of Gentiles by Jews? Jews assumed that a Gentile would be an idolater, that they would be a polytheist, that they would worship many gods. And then secondly, Jews would just assume that Gentiles had been sexually immoral. Um, I'm not sure that that is probably fair. But this was one of the concerns, I think, of uh, Peter, uh, of the Jews and Gentiles eating together at Antioch. Uh, I think the church headquarters didn't trust that the Gentiles would be sexually pure. That shows up in the list, right? Um, how the food is prepared, but also that they abstain from sexual uh, immorality. Um, and so, uh, there was this kind of prejudice by Jews that assumed that Gentiles would be sexually immoral. And, and uh, basically, Paul must have given them stern teaching on this when he was in Thessalonica, basically saying, you guys need to make sure to control your bodies. Keep control of your bodies, people. Um, uh, so not to wrong their brother. So this idea of uh, uh, wronging your brother suggests to me that Paul may have adultery uh, primarily in, in mind here. Uh, but of course, we would say that in Christ, uh, the female uh, it can be wronged too. This is one of the problems of, of the ancient world is the woman didn't really count. It was all about men offending other men. So the, the problem with, with having an affair uh, in the ancient world wasn't that you'd wronged your wife. Oh, that doesn't count for most people. Rather, you've wronged the husband of whoever you slept with. That was the prejudice of, uh, sexual prejudice of, of the ancient world. So uh, the, the idea of wronging your brother here probably suggests that Paul primarily has adultery uh, in mind. And basically, he says that God cares about these things, and he reveals that he had talked about these things when he was with them. Uh, for God has not called us in impurity, but in holiness. Boy, he's making a point of this here, isn't he? One wonders if Timothy got wind of some um, uh, bad business in the Thessalonian community. Why would Paul be emphasizing this if sexual immorality was not uh, perhaps an issue? Among, potential issue among the Thessalonian house church. And of course, we do, we do see uh, this is an awkward situation where you have men and women in, in a house church who aren't in that society used to being around each other. And I personally think that 1 Corinthians 11, the head covering, um, has a lot to do with trying to create sexual boundaries in uh, such, a, such a narrow uh, environment. But uh, Paul really lays it down here, doesn't he? So verse 8, Paul really gets down to business here. He says, therefore, the one who rejects this idea is not rejecting a person. You're not rejecting me. If you, if you, if you have an affair with somebody, you're not rejecting me. You're rejecting God. <laughs> um, and of course, um, if a person believes in God, this is, of course, a weighty thing to say. I'm not sure that everybody who, who says they believe in God actually does believe in God because uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, us don't live the way we would live if we really believed in God. 
Um, and this God is the one who also has given us his Holy Spirit. Uh, and so um, you got, you've got God inside of you. And so you, you don't want to invent, offend God inside of you. Um, this is not a good idea because God, and he has got, Paul's already talked about the justice or the, the, the penalty of God, the vengeance of God. I don't like to speak of it in the, that terms, but basically if you've got God in your, in your self and you're doing these things, you, you don't, you should expect to get some judgment there. You should expect to get some, uh, some negative consequences if you're not um, controlling your body and living in holiness, because it's, it's, it's kind of like, um, it's one thing to uh, offend God when you're outside of his property, uh, but it's another thing to offend God when you're on his property. Uh, I'm trying to find metaphors that can, can get us uh, out of our worldview and into the kind of the New Testament worldview. Well, verse nine, he deals with another topic. Uh, now concerning brotherly love, you do not have need for me to write you, for you yourselves are taught by God. This word, you're a theodidact. That is, God taught you this. You, all, I, you didn't need me. You didn't need me. You didn't need me to teach you to love each other. You already loved each other. You're a, you're a, a God. You're you're taught by God, uh, without a middleman, without a preacher, without a priest. You're a theodidact, um, in order that you love one another. They're, they're doing well at this one. They don't even need his instruction. Verse 10. For also you are doing it toward all the brothers and sisters uh, who are in all of Macedonia. Um, so apparently uh, there is communication between Philippi and Thessalonica. Uh, that there's, there's, they're not just isolated churches, but these churches are in communication and fellowship with, with each other. And we encourage you, brothers and sisters, to abound even more, verse 11, and to, um, to value uh, a quiet life and to attend to your own things and to work with your own hands, uh, just as we commanded you. Uh, we're going to, uh, in 2 Corinthians, I mean, sorry, in 2 Thessalonians, there's especially a concern for idleness. Um, that's where the Protestant work ethic comes from. Second Corinthians three, I mean, second Thessalonians three, the one who doesn't work will not eat. Um, and so here Paul encourages them uh, to work with their own hands, to mind their own business, not to be gossips. Um, verse 12, in order that you might walk properly toward those who are outside um, and uh, that you might have need of, of anything. Uh, or yeah, so um, mind your own business, work with your hands, um, don't be idle, in other words, and behave properly toward those who aren't in the family of God, those who aren't in the church. Um, and uh, then if you supply your own need, uh, again, there are times you can't supply your own need, uh, but uh, if you can, work with your own hands, have your own job, um, supply your own need um, uh, so that you don't have need that, of, of any outsider and that, that was Paul's philosophy, of course. He worked with his hands as a tent maker. Okay, verse 13. Now, as we're, now, we're getting, now we get into the end times part of this chapter. Now, we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers and sisters, concerning those who, have, uh, those who are sleeping, in order that you might not grieve. Now, sleep here um, is a metaphor for death, um, those who have died. And um, so there are those who take sleep somewhat. So there, there, there are layers of literalness here. So uh, there are some groups like the Seventh-day Adventists uh, who, who do not believe that we will be conscious in between our death and the resurrection when Jesus returns. Um, and they would point to passages like this in 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul talks about death as a sleep. The thing is, there are other passages, and it's interesting, it's Paul's early writings that use the metaphor of sleep. Then after uh, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul never uses the metaphor of sleep again. So one wonders if he's refined his language after 1, Thessalonians 15, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 
when he had the kind of encounter with the uh, with the Corinthians over over the afterlife. Um, I believe that the the New Testament as a whole um, suggests that we will be conscious in between our death and our resurrection. That is to say, it seems to me that the New Testament implies that we will be disembodied and conscious in some other place before the resurrection when Christ returns and we will receive a resurrection body. Paul refers to the time between death and resurrection as a sleep, um, but um, at least by Paul's later writing. So for example, in 2 Corinthians and in Philippians, Paul seems to picture us being conscious ap upon our death. So it's a strange phenomenon. In 1 Thessalonians and 1 Corinthians, Paul uses the metaphor of sleep and says nothing about whether we're conscious in between death and resurrection. From 2 Corinthians on and in Philippians, Paul speaks of death as going to be with the Lord. And so you wonder, and we'll talk about this when we get to 1 Corinthians, uh, to 2 Corinthians 5, uh, some, who knows how long that'll be from now, um, could be next year uh, by the time we get there, we'll see. But it seems like there might have been some development in Paul's understanding of how the intermediate state works. Uh, it's not without its problems. It, it, the easiest thing to do would, would be to say, he's just using the metaphor of sleep here, um, but he, he still believes that we're conscious in between death and resurrection here. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna leave that uh, issue uh, for the moment, but he does use sleep uh, in this particular term. Um, now it's interesting here, and I, I alluded to this, I think, in a previous podcast, and that is that uh, when we preach, we tend to preach, you need to be ready when you die. At least that's the preaching I grew up with. Um, I mean, a lot of the preaching I grew up with. Basically, you don't know when you're going to die. You could be taken out into eternity at any time. You need to be ready because when you die, you're either going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell, and you want to be ready to go to heaven. That's the, a lot of the preaching I grew up with. Now, I also grew up with preaching about the second coming. Um, so in the 1970s, in the Hal Lindsey time, there was a lot of preaching about how um, Christ could come back at any time, and we needed to be ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come, and you've been left behind, you know. And so, um, but I don't remember these two perspectives being very carefully integrated. Now, I'm not saying that that the preachers I heard growing up had not integrated them. I'm just saying that I don't remember having them integrated myself. Uh, that doesn't, so how does it all fit together? And I would say that I'm, I'm teaching a, um, an online uh, Bible class right now. And I would say that my, um, or a number of my students don't have that sort of thing integrated either. And so it seems to me that we have tended to focus in our modern preaching on you die, you go to heaven or hell. And oh, oh yes, Jesus is coming back sometime and we need to be ready. I have argued in a, a, a previous podcast that I think it was exactly the opposite emphasis in Paul's early preaching. That is to say that Paul's early preaching focused on Jesus has died, Jesus has risen, Jesus will come again soon. I am trying to spread the good news to every creature as quickly as possible because the Lord is going to come back very soon. And we need to tell everybody we can. We need everybody to know that Christ is coming back. We need everybody to be ready because he's going to come back. And that Paul expected this to happen within his own lifetime. And so the focus of Paul's preaching was, you need to be ready. Christ is coming back. You need to be ready. Christ is coming back. Christ is going to come back. Christ is going to set up his kingdom on earth. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. We need to be ready. It seems to me that that was the focus of the earliest preaching of Paul and the early Christians. Now, so here's the thing. Paul must have preached that at Thessalonica, and then maybe after Paul left, somebody died. And, and the Thessalonians, I'm, I'm, this is hypothetical, and the Thessalonians were like, oh, such a shame. Uncle Joe died. He was so looking forward to Jesus coming back in the kingdom of God, and now he's not going to be a part of it. And Paul's like, 
oh, no, 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 no. There's a resurrection. The dead in Christ, they're going to be part of it. God's going to bring them back. It's not just going to be those of us who are alive, but those who die who are in Christ will come back and be part of the kingdom of God too. There's a resurrection. And so that's what Paul seems to be addressing here in the last part of 1 Thessalonians 4. I, I, I do not want you to be ignorant, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are sleeping, uh, so that you would be grieved when Uncle Joe dies, just as other people do who don't have hope, which is everybody else. And most people in the Mediterranean world did not believe in an afterlife. There's a famous uh, epitaph on, on tombs in the Roman world. I was not, uh, so I was not, I was, I am not, I care not. Um, in other words, uh, there was a time when I didn't exist. And then there was a time that I did exist. And now I don't exist anymore. And I don't really care because I'm dead. Um, and so the, the overwhelming assumption of ancient people was, this is all there is. And then you die. And that's it. That's what most people thought. I mean, there were, there were some who believed in the afterlife, you know, the Egypt, some Egyptians believed in the afterlife, you know, some, some Greeks believed in the afterlife, but the majority of people, or some people believed in a kind of recycling, you know, where your atoms come back in another form, but it's, you don't remember anything. Um, and so there was a general sense in the ancient world at the time of Paul that death was the end of everything. And so Paul says here, we're not like those who have no hope. Um, I don't want you to be ignorant like those who have no hope of, of any life after death. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and was raised, so also God will lead with him those who sleep through Jesus. So there is a connection between Jesus' resurrection and our resurrection. I don't think I always noticed this. I learned this in, in seminary, I think it was, that, that basically, and, and it's all over 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus is the first fruit of the dead and that we will be part of the rest of the harvest if we die before he returns. We have hope because just as God raised Jesus from the dead, so also God will raise us from the dead. God will Jesus will bring with him at his second coming, those who have died. That's what verse 14 says, those who have sleep, those who are sleeping. There's that sleep metaphor again. Verse 15, for I say this to you uh, by the word of the Lord, that we who are living, who are remaining at the parousia, at the arrival of the Lord, we will not precede those who have slept. Um, Notice, we who are alive and remain. You know, I've, I've always read over that and kind of thought, that's me, if, I alive, if I'm alive and I remain. But I think Paul's thinking about himself and about the Thessalonians. At this point, they think that Jesus is going to come back very imminently. Of course, we have to, that is, that is a normal belief. We should believe that Jesus could come back imminently. Jesus, we need to be ready for Jesus to come back at any time, at any moment. But Paul and the Thessalonians, thought it would happen then, within their lifetime. At this point, in Paul's earliest of letters, Paul's thinking that Jesus is going to come back before he dies. At least that's, that's my Im, Im, uh, impression here. Verse 16, here's the great verse. Because the Lord, with the command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, will descend from the sky, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Okay. So the dead in Christ will rise first. It is interesting that he says dead in Christ. Uh, I, have, I have mused, I've, I've gone through Paul's writings a number of times looking for references to a general resurrection. And the only thing I've really been able to find is in 2 Timothy, where it calls God the judge of the living and the dead. There might be one other place that I found that might be taken to imply a general resurrection. But it is fascinating. Paul focuses in his writings pretty much entirely on the dead in Christ. And I don't think he's talking about Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. He's talking about people who were baptized in Christ. Um, and, and so certainly if Uncle Joe became a Christian when Paul was in Thessalonica and he was baptized, he would be 
the dead in Christ. Um, and of course, again, um, it's a bit of a sensitive matter but I don't think that you can be a good exegete of the Bible and not conclude that there is some development of understanding, at least a development of precision of understanding in the pages. And so it may very well be that Paul doesn't have yet uh, as full an understanding of all these things at this point as, as he does say when he writes Philippians. But again, I'm not gonna argue for that. I'm just throwing it out there as the musings of of, of uh, uh, a long-term exegete here. But the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, of course, you say today, well, what about people who were cremated and put in the sea? Um, you know, and they were a Christian, they were, they were, somebody cremated them, they were, their ashes have been spread on the waters, or what about a, a body that's disintegrated? And uh, I probably have the, I mean, it's, it's, it's gar I guarantee you, I have the atoms of millions of people in my body. Uh, you know what I mean? Atoms that have been in other people um, over over history, um, and they've you know they've made their I don't know whether it's millions, but I I I I'm quite convinced that of all the disintegration that happens throughout history, and then people eat stuff, um, and you know, uh, so I'm, I'm sure that there are molecules in my body that have been in many other people, and so what does it mean? What 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 where's gonna where where is God going to get a body? And of course, my answer is that God is very good at what he does, and that God is a God who creates something out of nothing. He can do ex nihilo creation. I have no doubt that God will be able to resurrect the dead in Christ. I have no doubt. I, I imagine God will start with, with whatever body is left of us and go from there. But it is, it is important. There is an empty tomb. Jesus' body is not in the tomb. It, it, they, they will never find the bones of Jesus because he is risen. And so the graves will, will be open. Now, I'm not saying that they, I, I think that God can pull a body uh, through ground. Uh, I don't know, you know whether they'll be literally opened or, or not. But if there, uh, my father is buried in Indianapolis, Indiana, and when the resurrection happens, whatever is still in that coffin will, will be given a body 2.0. Of course, we'll have to get to 1 Corinthians 15 to talk a little bit more about, about resurrection bodies. Verse 17, then we, the ones living and remaining, then together with them, will be snatched up uh, into the clouds uh, for the meeting of the Lord in the air, and so always will we be with the Lord. Now, this is where the idea of a rapture comes from. Uh, the Latin of will be caught up uh, is something like, um, I forget the exact form of it, but it's rap, raptando uh, or something like that in Latin. So the word rapture, you know, you know, if you've ever watched Jurassic Park, raptor, you know, uh, they grab stuff. Um, and so there is a notion of being seized from the earth. So uh, N.T. Wright, I think, has rightly uh, compared this arrival to a dignitary coming to a city and everybody going out to the edge of the city to welcome the dignitary into the town. In this case, it is Christ uh, returning from heaven. Of course, they they thought of heaven as being straight up. Um, I think of heaven today as being in another dimension or uh, another, another elsewhere, um, uh, because of course, wherever God is, um, he was there before there was a universe or any space. Uh, but um, so for 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 our un, for our sake, uh, Jesus arrives on the clouds. The uh, the dead in Christ arrive with him in their resurrection body, and then we who are alive and remain go out to the edge of the city. That is, go up into the sky. And and I don't think that we're going off to have apple pie. This is the beginning of the judgment in Paul's writings. He will talk about us judging the world. In 1 Corinthians um, uh, 6, 2, I think it is. In 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 2, 2 and 3, Paul talks about us judging angels, about us judging the world. And so the image here in 1 Thessalonians is of us who are alive, joining Christ in the sky along with the resurrected dead to begin the final judgment. In other words, we're going to come back down and participate in the, in the judgment. That is, um, I think, what we get when we integrate this passage with uh, 1 Corinthians 6. 
Now, some of you may be saying, well, what about the tribulation? Or what about the Antichrist? And of course, um, we'll get into some of those questions a little bit more when we get into 2 Thessalonians. But for the moment, I want to point out that there is no seven-year tribulation that Paul talks about here. Uh, Paul never talks about a seven-year tribulation uh, or a tribulation of, of that kind of a prescribed time uh, in his writings. In, in fact, there is some question as to whether, um, uh, well, let me say that the, the person who came up with the idea of a seven-year tribu tribulation was a man by the name of John Darby, uh, who lived in the 1800s, and he ingeniously wove together passages from here and there. So there's a week in Daniel, and if the week is seven years, uh, then if that week wasn't fulfilled in Daniel, then we can say, well, we need we need to fulfill that week, right? And we're going to do it at the end of time. There are a couple of three and a half year periods mentioned in Revelation. I think it's a, a reference to the same three and a half year period multiple times. But if you mold, if you add them, if you add them together, three and a half plus three and a half makes seven. Uh, there is a, a phrase in Revelation: "These are they who have come out of great great tribulation." Now, I think the King James and some other versions say the great tribulation, but there's no the in the Greek. It simply says in the Greek. These are they who have come out of great tribulation. In other words, it's not the great tribulation in Revelation. It's great uh, tribulation. And so, again, I'm not going to say how it's God's business, how he wants to do this. If God wants to have a seven-year tribulation, God can have a seven-year uh, tribulation. That's not my, my point. My point is, is that there is no indication at all in 1 Thessalonians 4 of a seven-year uh, tribulation, but rather uh, there is a Christ returns, the dead rise, we meet them, the judgment begins. That's if if we were to build a eschatology out of First Thessalonians four, that would be kind of where we would end up. Now there are other passages, and we've talked about this idea of development. So uh, we'll we'll hold that thought until we get to Second Thessalonians, where we have some very very interesting comments by Paul in second in second thessalonians okay final verse of this chapter therefore encourage one another with these words because jesus is coming back the dead will have hope the dead will rise and we will be part of we won't be on the earth we won't be on the earth when the judgment begins according to this passage we will be taken to be with the lord and we will be on the the safe side of the army lines um, in in the final judgment. Now, um, let me let me just uh, make a final comment about the rapture. Um, I've heard a lot of people say that the Bible doesn't teach a rapture, and I'm I'm to be honest, I'm still not a hundred percent sure what they mean by that, because I'm I'm okay with the idea of a rapture. Um, because this chapter talks about being seized up to be with the Lord. So th there's clear biblical grounds in this chapter for a seizing, for a rapture of, of Christians on the earth uh, to be with the Lord uh, prior to the judgment. Now, I think what those who say there's no rapture in the Bible are saying is, I think what they're saying is there's no rapture before before a seven-year tribulation. I think that's what they're saying, and I'd be delighted for anybody to comment on that um, in the notes uh, here on YouTube or on uh, Pat Patreon. Um, but it seems to me that probably, I think what they're saying is, is that there's no biblical grounds for a seven-year tribulation. I think that's what they're saying. Although maybe I'm wrong, maybe that's not what they're, what they're saying. But there is clearly a seizing of those who are uh, here in this chapter. I think N.T. Wright does some figurative things um, uh, with this, but I'm, I'm, I'm taking it at what seems to be face value here um, for me in 1 Thessalonians 4. Well, feel free to disagree. I may disagree with myself in a couple days. Who knows? Uh, but this has been my attempt to, um, to walk through 1 Thessalonians 4, looking at some of the issues uh, that are raised and uh, by Paul and uh, trying to get a, our heads around what Paul was trying to say in this chapter. So this has been Through the Bible in 10 Years, 1 Thessalonians 4.